What does priesthood in the Old Testament have to do with Catholic priesthood? Didn't Jesus do away with the Levitical priesthood, temple worship, and bloody sacrifices? How can we think scripturally about holy orders? Join us today as we explore those questions and more with Dominican Father Anthony Gimbroni, Professor of New Testament at the French Biblical and Archaeological School of Jerusalem. I'm Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm President of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka, President of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And today's episode is going to center on what the Bible tells us about the Catholic priesthood, with a special look at the priesthood in the Old Testament. I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology here at Franciscan University, as well as Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization, also here at the University. I'm glad to welcome today's guest, Dominican Father Anthony Gimbroni. Father Anthony is an alumnus of Franciscan University, and he now serves as a professor at the New, of New Testament at the French Biblical Archaeological School of Jerusalem, and is also author of the book that we're going to talk about today, The Bible and the Priesthood, Priestly Participation in the One Sacrifice for Sins, which is the book we're going to discuss. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be back on campus. Very nice. Your alma mater. It, and I don't recognize it. It looks so good. Oh, that's fantastic. I hope you recognize us. I do. <laughs> but you also look good. Right? I always look good. Very yes. Good. Yeah, yeah. If I had known you were this bright back then, you would have taught the courses that you were my student in. <laughs> Did you have both? I didn't. I oh. didn't have either. I was, oh. I was that rare oh, species that's trouble now. Mathematics. Were you really mathematics? Right. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. Well, there is a precision. Uh, to your study. No, that Father, is this, is, this is just a remarkable book. So maybe Thank just you. the beginning, what, why did you write it? What was moving in your heart that said, okay, this is the time? Um, it was what was moving in my inbox, actually. I, I, <laughs> I, I, was, I was asked to write it. Um, so it's not a book I would have conceived. Um, it's uh, Tim Gray and John Seahorn at the Augustine Institute have a great project, I think, um, a series of volumes on the biblical theology of the seven sacraments. So I was invited to do one on the priesthood and it didn't take a lot of reflection. I thought it was uh, it was an interesting uh, project, and and so I accepted. That's great. Yeah. What was the big in your study and your preparing? What was the biggest surprise for you? Um, I think the maybe the extent to which for me it, it became a case study in biblical hermeneutics. I mean, you can do all kinds of um, uh, types of biblical theology, and there's there's something very very central to the question of the priesthood, obviously theologically, and so I think it provided. Um, for me, a, a way to think about bigger questions about how to how to read the Bible theologically, um, and I mean, I took a, a, a key there just from a, a kind of passing remark that uh, that Benedict the Sixteenth had made, and that that opened up the way for me. But it was it was an experiment, and it was also something I had to do in a kind of compressed time. But yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. Well, Father, it's a work of massive scholarship. I hope somebody was teasing me when they said you were able to pull off this miracle in two months. Is um, that possible? July uh, and August. It was. It was uh, August and September. Oh, August and September. Yeah. I was. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was. It was a productive moment. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it happens. Yeah. No, I thought it was just, just again taking a look at the Old Testament roots of the priesthood. It's really quite. It's not. A, not an area that I've spent a great deal of time in, so I really appreciated that. Yeah, was that always your intent? Was to start there, or that's just where you found yourself? Well, I mean, that that was a, a little bit of, of a hint of what they're looking for in the series. Is they want something that is, you know, a comprehensive biblical picture. I think the way that I got into it um, probably took me in a slightly different direction than I didn't anticipate anything. I don't know if they did or not, yeah. but. Um, 
it was uh, pretty clear immediately that there's a massive body of material on the priesthood and also a very um, unapproachable corpus. I mean, the, the priestly um, literature is some of the most difficult in the Old Testament, so I think it, it often just gets avoided. <laughs> um, and that would be a catastrophe in a theology yeah. of the priesthood. Yeah. So you need to find a way to wrestle with things like Leviticus. Um, I, I think a lot of the attention has gone to the prophets. Um, that's that's maybe more accept, um, uh, approachable, but I think it skews it if we only have that that in the picture. So a kind of canonical um, harmony started to emerge and, and that just kind of wrote itself. You could almost write a separate book describing the methodology mm. that undergirds this yeah. particular experiment, as you call it. I mean, yeah. I, I see it as an exercise in biblical theology, but it really is an experiment. Yeah. And it's based upon what Nichols calls this hermeneutic of recognition that yeah. you cite a couple of times, which yeah. I think is a marvelous expression. But you know, Pope Benedict pointed out in his second volume of Jesus of Nazareth, that the criteria that were taught in Dei Verbum 12, Vatican II, the dogmatic constitution of divine revelation, and certainly the central section, uh, those four criteria, Ratzinger said, have scarcely been attempted. Yeah. You know, and so after the council, it just kind of lies there inert, and yet it's just full of a kind of dynamic potential that you unleashed in this book. And, you know, to, to tackle Leviticus 8 through 10 <laughs> in particular, I mean, everybody's least favorite, could overnight become something of a sensation, and not merely in apologetics, but to see the glory of God descending upon Aaron mm. and his sons, and yet to see something of a desecration by the time you get to chapters 9 and 10 with his two sons perishing for offering unholy fire. Mm -hmm. It's reminiscent you know, of the garden mm -hmm. where Adam is not just our first father, he's the high priest of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so the original sin is also a desecration of the garden sanctuary. And the parallels that are drawn out by the time the narrative arc is culminating in Hebrews, which is the epistle of the priesthood of the new covenant. I mean, you say this is written for seminarians. I can count on one hand the number of seminarians. I mean, I, I hope and pray that the next generation of seminarians will devour this and digest it well. But it really is an exciting, exciting experiment. Well, maybe, Thank Father, you. just take us there in Leviticus. And what is it, what is it teaching us? What is it, if you've got a seminarian in front of you, what is it teaching them about the priesthood? I mean, it's, it's doing a lot, and I say at the beginning that this is a very personal, selective uh, type of reading. But I, I jump into the middle of the middle book because I think structurally that, that actually holds a kind of primacy as we read the Pentateuch. And it, it, it is the story of the ordination of the first priest. It's the ordination of Aaron and his sons. Um, and that has these structural connections to the creation account. Um, there's a variety of ways that um, that this text in Leviticus is interpreting the text in Genesis and vice versa. Um, so by jumping in, in the middle, you begin at the beginning. Um, and there's something uh, kind of hermeneutically interesting about that. But I think this passage in Leviticus is, is perhaps um, the, 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 the easiest to, to understand because it's, it's a kind of little narrative window in, in a sea of legislation. So we're getting a lot of laws and then suddenly we get a story right. and then we jump back into laws. Yeah. Um, but there's a narrative logic to that as well. There, we're, we're getting the regulations so that they can perform this, this uh, ordination. And the ordination is the climax of this entire covenant experience at Sinai. Um, so there's, there's these direct links between commands that are given at the end of Exodus, and now finally their fulfillment. We've been waiting in this kind of narrative tension until this moment. And so that, that brings a force to this ordination, which itself has its own climax, and that's the manifestation of the glory of the Lord. Um, so the priesthood itself, the ordination of, of Aaron and his sons, is ordered to the offering of sacrifice. And the sacrifice is ordered to the manifestation of God's glory. And it's that simple, I mean, teleologically, that that's what the yeah. priesthood is doing, is it's manifesting God's glory um, through a sacrifice. There's a typological way that you can pull that out into sure. a kind of Christological uh, interpretation, but that's the core. Yeah. There's a, a little book by von Balthasar that just popped into my head, The Christian and Anxiety. Mm. And he says that the kabod, when it appears in the Old Testament, is crushing, mm. majestic, mm -hmm. overpowering. Right. And it almost demands a mediator who can soften the blow, right. which is why we need a New Testament. Right. Now, we don't want to push 
the analysis as far as Marcion and just jettison the old because it's no damn good. Mm. Everything matters after Jesus arrives. But the sense of both and, the figure and the fulfillment, you unpack that so beautifully, so brilliantly that I, I'm just dazzled. I'm, I'm, it's just daunting, uh, this enterprise that you've undertaken. And I, I'm still incredulous that you could pull it off in two months. <laughs> I was reminded of another von Baldazar title, and that is Truth is Symphonic. Yeah. Because there's something of a symphony in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have a capacity that is unique. Uh, it's almost as though you're playing the instruments of every member of the orchestra, overdubbing as you go, you know, because it doesn't in any way reject historical criticism, but you're drawing the good from that, as well as from the patristic and the medieval tradition, uh, and even from the Jewish and rabbinic tradition. I mean, how much you depend upon Professor Rabbi Yaakov Nogrom mm. um, and his, his understanding of uh, the sanctuary of Israel as being like the portrait of Dorian Gray, mm. you know, where Israel can continue on in spite of its sinfulness because all of that is being heaped up mm -hmm. on the sanctuary, which doesn't make any sense until Christ. Right. And then suddenly it's like, symphony, this goes beyond anything I've heard before. And you recognize that this is, this is divinely scripted, you know, and the way that you apply the unity of the old and the new uh, shows that you don't reject the old or even relegate it to some kind of back seat. If anything, you get far more out of reading the old in light of Christ. Right. And this is why Marcion was an idiot. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was a species of lunacy yeah. to think that you could get rid of the one and preserve the other. And you speak about, about this Christological, to build on this Christological mm -hmm. interpretation of the Old Testament. So yeah. may, maybe speak to that. What? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a delicate thing. It's obviously, I mean, central to the whole tradition and, and we are going to end up in an impossible circumstance if we can't read the Old Testament as Christian revelation. Um, that, that's actually where the book starts is a, a remarkable um, comment by Benedict XVI out of the silence of his retreat where he says the perduring crisis of the priesthood has um, its deepest root in, in, in a methodological problem. This is a very right. Benedict yeah. kind of way of looking at it, but yeah. it's the inability to read the Old Testament Christologically. And so, I mean, the whole book is in a way just a, a kind of a meditation on that comment. Um, it's, it's tricky because it's an asymmetry. I mean, there's, there's this necessity of the two right. testaments, but yeah. they're, they're, they're not just strictly parallel. Um, and there's, there's a kind of deficiency written into the Old Testament that's important to acknowledge. In fact, that's central, I think, to the, to the whole project is, okay, I said the priesthood leads us to sacrifice, manifestation of God's glory, but the very next thing that um, happens right. is this original sin. So the, 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 the incapacity of the priesthood to maintain this crushing glory is immediately apparent. And it's apparent on every page in the Old Testament and it's demanding a solution. That's where the prophets come in um, oh pointing out the problems in, with uh, kind of unvarnished clarity. Um, and so that I think is, is what um, configures the Old Testament as, as a prophetic statement, word, um, pointing towards towards the fulfillment. And yet there's an integrity to it. There's there's a kind of integral character yeah. to the typological statements, uh, the typological narrative that that somehow already gives us the Christian story. Um, so it's, it's finding that balance. Um, I think one of the big um, errors, I mean, the, the, the Neo-Martianite um, is, is Harnack and there's, there's, a, there's a modern um, kind of neo-neo-Martianism uh, neo uh, on, on offer again today um, because the, the opposition of this asymmetry is overextended. And so you get, and this is a very Lutheran um, impulse, is, is a law gospel opposition. And I think yeah. that's, that's fundamentally the kind of methodological error that, that Ratzinger sees. That's the key, I think, to see that law gospel is not polarized. It's not antithetical. They're not an opposition but they are analogical. Mm -hmm. I mean, the continuity and discontinuity, uh, Christ is hiding in the Old Testament, but in plain view, mm -hmm. once he comes. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't in any way diminish the Old Testament, as I said, but the Old Testament read on its own is like a story in search of an ending with the people of God in exile. Right. And even when the glory of God is restored to the high priest in, what is it, Sirach 50, with Simon, as you point out, you know, the Maccabeans, the Hasmonean dynasty, it's crushed once again. 
but only in Christ mm -hmm. and in Hebrews especially. But as you go back and allow Hebrews to sort of force you to reread things in these terms, you realize that the New Testament itself is unintelligible apart from the old. Yeah. Right. Even though we prefer the new and kind of our closet Marcionites in the sense of, you know, the new, we don't, we don't need the old anymore. We right. need it more. Yeah, there, there's this marvelous Catholic sensibility, which I think you, you uphold in such a wonderful and erudite way, that God is really the author of both nature and grace, mm. cosmos and covenant, that there's not the antitheses between the two. They're not polarized, mm -hmm. they're complementary, analogical, as, as Scott rightly points out. Yeah. And, and so grace is not the enemy of nature. The new is not the enemy of the old. Why can't we have both? God is the author of each. He's the architect of the whole blooming show. So there ought to be these parallels. Right. I love how you put it, Jesus is hidden in the Old Testament. He's hiding somewhere. Mm -hmm. He's got a clever disguise. The way that I kind of looked at it was, I guess, in a similar thing is I obviously walked into the book reflecting on the priesthood. So it was like this lens or a keyhole almost that I was looking that you gave mm -hmm. us a view of the Old Testament through through this orders, right? The Holy Order, right. the priesthood, and those kinds of things. So it, it was an interesting thing because as I went through the book, it opened up to me that there was much more than, than I expected, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, yeah, it was, it was the, the, the Holy Orders priesthood was the lens with which I could see that. And then as you do beautifully, as been articulated as that you reveal not only the priesthood, but the glory of God, the sacraments, Jesus mm -hmm. himself, so that. Mm -hmm. So uh, stay with us. We'll have much more to discuss about this. When I was very young, I wanted to be a priest. I even played mass as a kid. Uh, and then in high school and coming to college at Franciscan University, took that uh, discernment seriously, discovering a call to priesthood and religious life and uh, a strong desire to celebrate the sacraments for the people of God. Have you ever felt a growing sense of hope in a new day? Like when the dawn light breaks and the world wakes up. We feel that every day because we know that light changes everything. It opens our eyes to possibilities and it propels us forward. Light shows us where we belong. Light is what the world desperately needs. Be light at Franciscan University. The Lord, I think, had done a lot within my heart uh, coming up to this point in my life where I was put into a leadership role uh, in my last year of college. And eventually I started to see the Lord start to use me in ways that I never expected. And so finally, I think that drew me to a place of openness where I just said to the Lord, Lord, if you can use me in these things, I think you can do so much more with, within my heart and within the lives of others through the role of the priesthood. And so eventually I just saw that desire for the priesthood really come about. And so figured it was time to actually do something about it. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about the relationship between Christ's priesthood and the priesthood in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the things you, you spent actually quite a bit of time is you said that Aaron is ordained and then it, you don't use the word dumpster fire, but it becomes a train wreck, right? It, right. And the brokenness and the sinfulness and the scandal of, of the priesthood yeah. then. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important. Um, that's that's the starting point for this comment by by Benedict is the crisis of the priesthood, and I guess I just try to inscribe that in in a much bigger crisis. That it's not you know just the council. This this has something to do. This is salvation historical. Um, you have a fundamental problem when um, the, the the human priest, the purely human priest, is demanded to do something that's beyond his nature. Um, and so, I mean, we talked about this relationship in nature and grace, but the, the, the problem of priestly sin is not new. It's primordial, um, like the problem of human sin um, and the ways that the priesthood and the order of creation are connected is, is an important dimension of that as well. But in any case, I, I wanted to, to foreground that um, for, for any number of reasons, principally because I think it's the way the Bible talks about yeah. the priesthood. <laughs> Um, and it prevents us from, um, you know, uh, an excessively one-sided image of the glory of the priesthood as this, this mediation of the glory. And that's where having the, the priestly corpus um, 
which has its own way of talking about this problem, and the prophetic corpus in, in the right proportions is, is important, because the, the prophetic corpus has its own way of shaming the priests. Right, yeah. And you need to take account of that. Um, but also in, in, in context, I mean, uh, because the prophets um, have been misinterpreted um, in, in some terrible ways as, as uh, rejecting the very possibility of sacrifice. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something that I think is, is a problem. There's also a way that the prophets see that priestly sin is actually enmeshed in this network of human sin. And, and they, they signal out the priest less than you'd think. Right. They, they see this, this human community that's, that's collapsing. And so it also puts the priest back in his proper uh, yeah, proportions, yeah, yeah. and I think that's very important. I wrote in the margins, I don't know how many times, murder, murder, <laughs> murder, I mean, because right. yeah. Yeah. it's just, it's, it was, I don't know, maybe we'll talk more about it. I don't, as I was reading it as a priest, it would be interesting in your thought as well, is there was this sense of sadness, but also in a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just like, oh my gosh, it's been a problem from the very beginning. Yeah. But oh my gosh, it's been a problem since the very beginning. Right. right. And the yeah. Lord still right. works in this and he still works. Yeah. Still yeah. I'm, I'm obviously not a priest, but the prospect of being one strikes me as terrifying. Mm -hmm. Also, the prospect of being a husband and father, mm -hmm. equally terrifying. More terrifying. The scandal of sin is everywhere. Right. It's ubiquitous. I was really struck by the line you quote from Walter Casper, mm. that somehow there is this ontological infusion of stable grace, mm -hmm. he calls it, which is a source of consolation, right. not just for the laity, but especially for the priest. Yeah. How can I bear this yeah. burden? It's so huge. Yes. I'm the instrument of something infinitely larger yeah. than myself. How yeah. can I do that? Yeah. No, it's, it is this mingled, um, I mean, hope prevailing over despair. There's, there's a beautiful novel you'd probably know, um, Edmund O'Connor um, won the Pulitzer Prize on the edge of sadness, or the edge of sadness, it's called. But it's, it's the story of, of a broken priest um, who, whose life, both per personally and professionally, is 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 marred by human fragility, yeah. um, and the way that that he discovers subtly, beautifully, um, the, the the workings of grace through that, in comparison to this this um, priest friend he has, who's succeeding in every conceivable way. Right. I yeah. mean, there's there's yeah. there's something wonderful about this acknowledgement of the fragility of humanity, yeah. um, that especially you know in a moment where the, the 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 sins of the church are on open view for the whole world. I think it's important just to see it in its proper context. It's. Yeah. It's not a design flaw in as much as a happy fault is not a design flaw. I mean, right, this, is, this right. has been pre-programmed. And it's not an excuse. It's, it's not an excuse. It's, excuse. it's always been this. It's not an excuse. Right, right. Yeah, that was how St. John Chrysostom viewed uh, Judas. It wasn't the apostleship that had fallen. Right. It was Judas, right. the bad choices he made. It right. was the will that, right. that was bent in the wrong direction. Yeah. I, I don't remember if you would, is it up to, taught us that you yes. quote, yes. you know, it's an outrageous statement, yeah. you know, that if an adulterous priest, a murderous priest, yeah. a drunkard right. baptizes, it's Christ who baptizes. Right. I mean, right. that's the fourth century when the Donatist heresy, after persecution, said that all of these priests who lapsed and denied the faith or fell into sin and all the others too, this disqualifies them. Right. And Optatus, and then even more famously, Augustine just says, no, it's Christ who is the high priest in heaven who works through these earthly means. And we're just so instinctively drawn to a kind of polarity. On the one hand, I think we have a romanticized idealism that in most periods of history, most priests were good. Well, maybe, but maybe not, you know. Mm -hmm. But this book gives us that sober and salutary reminder that it's always been Christ, mm -hmm. you know, that, that he was the one whose grace infused Adam, Aaron, Simon, and everybody in between. And again, you just have the sense that if you showed up at a work site and you saw a pile of girders, you know, and, and lumber and wiring and all kinds of things, if somebody were to say, come back in a year, it'll be a skyscraper, yeah. you're a fool. You know, it's just a pile of materials, you know. But the idea that Christ isn't plan B, but that this was from eternity in the beginning before the foundation of the world, that is what, in a certain sense, casts a dignity even upon Aaron with the golden calf or his two sons, but also upon our parish priest when we find out his flaws and foibles. Mm -hmm. It's always been Christ. 
Yeah, and I think St. Francis recognized that. There's a beautiful story of if, if the priest was the greatest sinner in the community, oh, no. he's mm -hmm. still right, the right. priest. He's he still wouldn't offered. kick him. Right, right, yeah. right. He was right. still on his hands. Right, yeah. his hands. With that right. lovely yeah. Portuguese proverb about God writing straight with crooked pencils. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I tell my students, I'm just about the, the most crooked pretzel in the store, but God is able to write straight with even someone as crooked as I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They and, believe it. And I appreciated the the manner with which, and I think you did it very delicately. You know, it wasn't, you know, the, we're gonna, but you, in the same way you talk about the, the scandal of the priesthood, the brokenness of the priesthood, and then you talk that the priest is also the glory of God. Right. Um, you speak of the, the manifestation of the divine's glory. So this same mm -hmm. priesthood, which is, as you said, broken, flawed, mm -hmm. Um, is also reveals the divine glory. And we see that in the same text, in the same story. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's back to this, um, uh, this symphony of truth that the Bible interweaves all of these, these themes together. And it's, it's very important in our reading that we capture that and, and, and can resonate. Our theology should, should echo back that, that, that same blending. But you know, you have to agree that it's a pretty shocking uh, juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Here's the predatory priest mm -hmm. on day one, and then later on in that same day, he's confecting the Eucharist right. or absolving sinners who right. are far less flagrant right. than he. Right. I mean, I mean, this drove Luther mad. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Which is why I think we have an entire Reformation hermeneutic that that kind of obsesses on on this point. And even if okay, you know, we can't idealize and say there was a moment where all priests were perfect. I mean, there there are moments when there's a kind of aggravated problem um, that demands a kind of prophetic rage, um, and that's that's present there, and it's important to to acknowledge that. But the prophetic rage is too easily misconstrued in. Protestant tradition in terms of it's a, a pro prophetic rejection of the priesthood. Mm -hmm. yeah. But once you recognize that, you know, corruptio optima pessima, that when the best is corrupted, that's what becomes the worst, mm -hmm. then you realize that the prophetic denunciation of the priesthood is precisely because of the holiness that is uniquely invested in the high priest and all of the, Levit it's, you know, right. the Levitical it's orders. If they throw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater, right? right. Mm -hmm. Is that what? Yeah. With I mean, yeah, Shakespeare has a great line, lilies that fester will smell worse than weeds. Mm. But that's not an argument for digging up your garden and right. getting rid of all the, the lilies. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, there is that first step of the Protestant argument that is initially compelling. That is, why is hierus, the Greek word for priest, never applied to the apostles? Yeah. You mm. know? And you do a very good job of kind of unpacking that. I think Brian Stewart, you, you cite his dissertation as a Protestant, which he did under Wilkin at UVA. It's like, well, you know, and, and this is the move that I prefer to make, that prior to the promulgation of the Mosaic law and the Aaronic priesthood in Exodus and Leviticus, you have a pre-Levitical form of priesthood and sacrifice that is patriarchal. Not that they do better you know, than Aaron and his sons. But then you can see that the principle of the elder, the presbyteros, you know, that is the preferential term that mm -hmm. is applied to the ministry of the apostles precisely because it's not reducible to the Levitical or to the Aaronic. Mm -hmm. That it actually restores something that goes back long before the Exodus, which is rooted in the family order with the father and hopefully the firstborn son, though he typically fails. And so you see, okay, the curriculum of creation was always ordered Christologically when the father would send his firstborn son. Well, why call him Hierus if everybody was going to associate that simply with the Levites right. or the high priest in the earthly Jerusalem temple? It's like, wow, okay, we're not only restoring creation and the family order, we're elevating it to a heavenly, divine, and eternal priesthood. We're also transforming sacrifice, and I think this is this is that's one of the things that's 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 central here. So I mean, there's a continuity. There's even a kind of deference in the New Testament to that which is not um, abrogated. I mean, so is the entire law dismissed? Is there a priesthood that can survive this transition? Yes, there is, but it's it's fantastically remade. Um, and the character of sacrifice is, is not the same, which is the, the, the confusion that would be introduced by using all that same terminology. Right. Is it's not just going to be a continuation of this thing that is, you know, 
whatever, a giant barbecue for, for centuries and yeah, centuries. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a completely different conception of sacrifice. And to that, we need a kind of emergent new concept of priesthood. And so that, that's what's happening terminologically, I mean, I think in the New Testament is you need to retire a kind of usage yeah. in order to give expression to the, the novelty of the new. So, yeah. so your concern was that they would, they would have this idea of what it was to be priest, and if that language would have been the same, it wouldn't have allowed them to make the step yeah, that Jesus was inviting. Yeah. I mean, in its, in its strict designation, it would mean he's a Levite, which is right. not what we mean. Yeah, right. Um, and that his task is sacrifice, therefore, he has to go to the temple, which is sort of like a slaughterhouse. Right. It's a butchery, you right. know. Right. And maybe speak to that, because you spend quite a bit of time dealing with the sacrifice. How, how is the sacrifice different? What, what does that mean? What does sacrifice mean before and what does it mean after Jesus? Yeah, well, I mean, this, this is where the, the centrality of, of the cross itself, um, Christ's self-offering reconfigures priesthood sacrifice in, in, in one. So there's different vectors you can come at this uh, with. I mean, sometimes you hear about the spiritualization of sacrifice. I mean, that's, that's good and problematic way of talking. I mean, I think that's one of the things that gets us into trouble with, with the prophets is that people think they have this spiritualization. They don't think there's, there's a, a real physical sacrifice. There's a personalization. I mean, the, the, the sacrifice of obedience. This is also one of the parameters that's um, now central um, is, is that um, it becomes a self-offering in obedience to God. And that gets configured through the priesthood of Christ into the participation in his priesthood. I mean, this is this is what we need to say beyond this is, I mean, Christ's priesthood um, uh, reigns supreme within the church, but there's a participation that we all have in this. Yeah. Um, and that means that our sacrifice needs to be conformed to the shape of his sacrifice. Um, so in any case, we need to uh, acknowledge that um, not only the, 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 the words, but the reality is yeah. being reconfigured. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is, I think, that his sacrifice, uh, you know, the lifting up of the sign, on the cross was so perfect, so definitive, that it created a space for the rest of us to make an unbloody sacrifice. Right. You know, the sacrifice, the oblation of self on mm -hmm. the same altar mm -hmm. of perfect sacrifice. Right. And the astounding thing is that you all uh, can do this in persona Christi when right. you mount the steps right. and you celebrate the Eucharist. Right. And unbloody and bloody, that's, that's one of the remarkable things um, there just in what I think Hebrews is doing, which is the great um, text on, on Christ's sacrifice. But there's, th there's in fact, this whole notion of, of a kind of sacrifice in heaven that's pervasive in the Judaism of the age. But that notion of an angelic, bloodless sacrifice is transformed in Hebrews because Jesus brings his blood right. into heaven. Um, and so heaven itself is being reconfigured. Right. Um, this, is, this is radical. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when wait, Christ, wait, wait, radical. Wait, wait, Rick, when, no, no, when no, Christ no. died on the cross, something happened in heaven. And we're going to talk about what happened in heaven when Christ died on the cross in just a moment. Stay with us. My advice for young men discerning the priesthood would be to pray, to develop a relationship with Jesus and to encounter him in their lives, and then to talk to someone, uh, a priest, a youth minister, a parent, about what is stirring in their heart that they might be able to hear some feedback and to uh, pursue the next step in their life. Walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. You'll explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage in the Holy Land, Poland, France, Austria, Italy, and more destinations. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we record here at the Com Arts Studio at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and equipment, and our theology professors, Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn, and I are speaking with Father Anthony Gimbroni, who is the author of The Bible and the Priesthood. Uh, Regis and I got a little um, heated there, physical there, but it's okay. Assault and battery, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah. But no, I, honestly, I think, I think it speaks of the passion and the beauty of, of yeah. what we were talking about, the, the beauty that is the sacrifice of Jesus, which is profoundly different than any other sacrifice. I love what you were saying. It's, it's not just this bloody sacrifice punishment, but it's, it's glorious. It's, speak to that. The, 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 the priesthood enters into that sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, where, where we left off there is, is that heaven itself is somehow being transformed. I mean, earth is being brought into heaven in the, the human nature of Jesus. Um, 
and that has a kind of trickle down uh, effect on Earth. Um, the, the the new heavens uh, have been made, remade, um, and the Earth is being remade at the same time. So there's this intermingling of a heavenly and a an earthly liturgy. And so even the form that we see there in heaven of this intermingling is also what transpires on the altars um, in our churches. That um, somehow the bridge of this mediation of the priesthood of Christ is what enables our worship to be something other than the very limited created uh, type of natural worship that um, we might be able to offer on our own resources. You said a minute ago, right before the break, that in the intertestamental period, Second Temple Judaism, there was already an emergent sense that there's Jerusalem on earth, but there's a Jerusalem above. There's a temple made with mm -hmm. hands, but there's also a temple that is divine. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is what helps us to respond to the objection that, oh, the Christian is simply imposing and transposing and, and really kind of breaking the mosaic and just taking the tiles and redesigning it. When in fact, no, this really was anticipated that in the Old Testament, the Levites through animal slaughter were doing something that somehow was an, an, not just a symbol, but an analogy of what the angels do. Mm -hmm. But in the prophetic visions of heaven, like in Isaiah 6, it's only the angels in heaven who are crying out, holy, holy, holy. Mm -hmm. But then the, you know, the, the aftermath of the resurrection and ascension, you see the elders in Revelation 4 joining in along with the martyrs and all of the saints with the angelic worship in this sacrificial sanctity that was really promised but never delivered in the Old Testament. Right. And you, know, you also see it in Matthew 27 where after the resurrection of Jesus, all these other tombs are opened, mm -hmm. and for a brief time until the ascension, presumably, these Old Testament saints were wandering around as witnesses that heaven is about to be repopulated by humans for the first time. And now, 2,000 years later, you know, it's like crickets chirping, ho oh, hum, who really cares? Right. Uh, the point that I wanted to make, uh, which was so rudely interrupted <laughs> by our host, is that there is an eternal resonance uh, taking place here. Uh, it's not static, it's dynamic, yeah, yeah. That, that Christ remains in agony until the end of the world. That's how Leon Bois put it. Mm -hmm. And then there's this stunning line from Origen about uh, the suffering of love. First he suffered, then he came down. And Origen asks himself, what was the nature of this suffering, this pathos? Mm -hmm. And he says, love. It wasn't justice. He didn't have mm -hmm. to suffer and die. It was love. He was moved by this, uh, this impossible love for right. humankind. But for the Father, I right. mean, he's suffering from all eternity. He turns to the Father with this sacrificial posture of dying to self forever. So he's able to do it in time which simply dramatizes an eternal drama. And that's, that's the inner logic of this obedience too. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a kind of perverse obedience of Christ on the cross, right. but it's, it's, it's a spontaneous gesture of love. Um, and so I think that's, that's, that's critical too, just to, to accent that point that at the center of the very conception of sacrifice is this shared love between the Father and the Son. No. It's, it's not grotesque uh, or brutal, though uh, there's, there's, right, right. there's a bloody price to pay Right. That's a simple remedy for a common error, that for about three hours, the love of the Father for the Son was veiled, obscured, or just simply shattered. Mm. When in fact, from a Catholic perspective, reading yeah. Scripture, you realize that the whole life of Jesus is a revelation of the love of the Father. But nowhere is that more profound and obscure than on the cross, that that is not veiling the love of the Father. That is not, in a sense, you know, blocking our view of the inner life of the Trinity, that is the most profound revelation because he's not losing his life mm -hmm. at the hands of the Romans. He is making his life a gift of divine and human love yeah. at his own hands when he confected the Eucharist, the initiation of the sacrifice, the consummation of the sacrifice, and then the, the kind of breaking the code of sacrifice, that it was never about destruction, immolation, and death so much as love, as Augustine puts it. That it sacrifice originates in the heart of love and then the soul the body then the whole social order as it were but this idea also to circle back the this is not like a new testament uh what do you call it when you have a dummy ventriloquism you know uh it really is like 
It's not just Jesus saying that the greatest command is Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love the Lord your God. Well, you, you say that, but you're, no. In Mark's gospel, even the Jewish lawyer recognizes that there are 613 commandments, but they're not all created equal. This one is created as to be the, the greatest of them all. And then the second, the love of, the love of neighbor, that's a quotation from Leviticus 19. Mm -hmm. And there I think we have a map. It's like holiness and righteousness are inseparable but distinct. The vertical beam of the cross points to God, holiness, the love of God above self. And then the horizontal beam is justice, righteousness, which is the love of neighbor mm -hmm. as self for the love of God. And so as simple as the sign of the cross is, I think in a certain sense, it's recycling the message that very often doesn't get through mm. to people, mm -hmm. that it's just about punishment, destruction, when it really is about love or our refusal to love. You know, in, in the Didache, we have this lovely phrase describing the cross as a sign of expansion. Mm. And yeah. the implicit message is only God can have so infinite a reach. He can expand himself indefinitely. He's infinitely elastic. Mm. He can encompass everything and everyone. Mm. I mean, I had a college professor who used to say, look, once the incarnation happened, everything and everyone changed. Right. Nothing remains the same. And you're sort of fleshing out yeah. the implications of that. Mm. And maybe just, Father, just for a moment or two, we spent quite a bit of time, and you spent quite a bit of time in the Old Testament, but you also bring the ordination, you take a look at the synoptics, you take a look at John and how they, so maybe just yeah. a little bit about that, about the holy orders and the priesthood. Do we, do we actually see it in the scriptures? Sure. Can we recognize it? Yeah, well, that's back to this, this hermeneutic of, of recognition. I mean, I think if, if if we know what we're looking for, we recognize it. Um, that's that's a circle that we get into by faith. But yeah, of course we do. And if if Jesus' own priesthood isn't on display, then there's a problem. Yeah. And it's not only on display in Hebrews, which might be enough. I, I mean, I think we, we see it in different ways. But you need to understand the language uh, of the scriptural authors, and it's a language that we've forgotten in a lot of ways. So I I mean, I I suggest there. I think I mean um, in the synoptics, for instance, there's there's different hints, but. To me, the transfiguration, for instance, is is a preeminent moment when we actually do see the uh, the priesthood of Christ on display. That's connected to a kind of red thread or, or purple scarlet thread um, that I'm that I'm drawing, because actually the the vestments of the high priest are a preoccupation um, from the Pentateuch all the way through the Judaism. I was actually going to mention that that you spend a lot of time. We don't yeah. we have time to do that, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. it's what it's it's the breakthrough it I think that I found in this it book, very yeah. the transfiguration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, Malachi. that's that's my my suggestion there. I think is that there's this attention to to the transformation of his garments and not just his face. Right. Yeah. So I'm curious why 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 does that matter? In in any case, I mean, I think that that might be one of one of the elements, and it's it's a beautiful thing when we read it in the whole canonical arc there, because it's not only the glory at that moment of Aaron's um, ordination where he, I mean, he manifests and there's there's a kind of mysticism in the Judaism of the second temple period about the, the divine kavod, the divine glory that somehow inheres in these priestly vestments. But then we also have the tarnished vestments. So you, you actually have this then in, in the 12, okay, there's this, this, this prophecy that Joshua, the high priest who comes in his soiled vestments is gonna be revested. Um, right. This then is connected to a revesting of the priest on the on the Day of Atonement, which um, I think is a kind of image, obviously, of that ultimate Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. um, you said the twelve. You meant the minor prophets. I mean the minor prophets. And Zechariah yes. three yes. and six. Yes. 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 Yeah. So, who hold a really key key place, I think, yes. in in this kind of emerging canonical sense, because they're rereading old texts and and, and kind of um, playing new themes on them. So you have a snowball effect um, that, that's leading us to this. <laughs> the red thread becomes the, a rope. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. And uh, so um, I, I think that's that's an example. Um, I, the, the Gospel of John has its own language. Um, it's it's a beautiful language. It's an evocative language. This, this, sh this transformation um, from the Levitical um, terminology, lexicon, to then pastoral imagery starts to emerge very, very prominently. You see this in John, but also um, in, in the epistles in the New Testament. So um, tracking that, I think, is, is important to see yeah. what's happening to the priesthood. And um, You know, the foot washing, we always kind of reduce to a moralistic humility, which it is, but to see that foot washing was actually part of the ordination rite of mm. Aaron and his sons in Exodus yeah. 30 and 40 right. also un, kind of unpacks why 
well, you're not going to wash my feet, Peter. You'll have no portion in me. Mm -hmm. And that technical term for portion, meros, is precisely what the Levites alone got. You know, mm -hmm. the 12 tribes got land. Well, the Levites don't get it. They get right. the Lord as their meros, their portion. And so what is Jesus doing in the upper room besides confecting the Eucharist, instituting the sacrament, which John kind of assumes, but he's focusing on something more of the mystical aspect of the ordination of the priests of the New Covenant. And, and priests, uh, uh, P Peter in particular, I mean, his, yes. his prominence here is obviously uh, significant, particularly in this, this narrative of, you know, the, 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 the troubled priest. I mean, pre it's, it's not an accident that, that we get the stories about Peter that we get. Um, so, so I think we, we over papalize everything that happens to Peter. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a problem. Um, and I think right. there's, there's a great deal. This is a, another good von Balthasar book, but the office of Peter, I think, needs to be understood in, in, a, in a very broad sense of the priesthood period. The priesthood, right. right. Yeah. Could we uh, return just for a moment to that event, the transfiguration oh, yeah. that you touch upon? It's a flashpoint. Uh, and maybe this is overly pious, but when St. John Paul instituted the Luminous Mysteries. That was number four, mm. followed by the institution of the Holy Eucharist. And it strikes me that the first two of the uh, Joyful Mysteries, Annunciation and Visitation, are sort of positioned in the same way. First, you receive Jesus, Mary, and then you carry him in the first Corpus Christi procession up the hill mm. to your cousin. Mm -hmm. Just as Jesus appears in all of his glory and majesty, luminosity, the point of it is to transfigure us mm -hmm. in the Eucharist, mm -hmm. which follows logically uh, mm -hmm. from that. Well, not logic. I mean, it's over. It's beyond logic. It's yeah. love. But it's, but it's a pattern that we see because this is also this kind of ordination, sacrifice, movement that um, is exactly what structured that first passage you look at in Leviticus. I mean, we anticipate this after ordination by heavenly journey, by, by the vesting of Jesus, all these sorts of things that are preparing him for the offering of the sacrifice. And that that be the Eucharist is exactly what we couldn't anticipate, but recognize in retrospect. Yeah. What I took away from this was the transfiguration immediately follows the passion prediction. And the passion prediction immediately follows the Petrine saying, you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and I'm on a roll type of thing, get thee behind me, Satan. But, you know, the prediction of the passion must have been absolutely overwhelming to the Twelve. Yeah. You know, where Peter's like, God forbid. And yet, the transfiguration is more than just, hey, to the, the three of you, I'll survive. In fact, yeah. I'll come out even better, I brighter, see you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to see that the passion is pointing to the priesthood, and the transfiguration of sacrificial love, which is the logic of priestly sacrifice. I mean, if that was the only thing I found in this <laughs> book, it was more than worth it, yeah. Well, please stay with us and we'll offer our final thoughts. One of the greatest pieces of advice that, that I was given was that it seems like you've discerned this for a long time by yourself and it seems like you're at a standstill. So you can no longer discern this further without actually going into it. And so in taking that next step but not being afraid to take that next step because there's something to be said about clarity coming with a step. When you see the world through a Catholic lens, you see God's hand at work in human history. You see the true, the good, the beautiful. Franciscan University of Steubenville's Master of Arts in Catholic Studies is an online program that offers courses in literature, biology, art, theology, psychology, all taught from a distinctively Catholic perspective so you can see the world with Catholic eyes. Find out more about the Master's in Catholic Studies. Go to franciscan.edu slash mcs. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, your final thoughts? Yeah, Father, I'm awed by uh, your industry and, and your brilliance. I can think of only one other person who could have written a book like that. Uh, and Scott, uh, he's already written it, uh, so you don't have to. But the two of you, I think, are rivals when it comes to biblical scholarship, and uh, it's breath catching. I, I can't thank you enough for this book. It's just really superb, first rate. You mentioned uh, a Balthazar book, uh, uh, The Office of Peter. It reminded me of, of another book 
uh, which I think was written for people like me, <laughs> a, a primer for unsettled laymen. <laughs> and there is a section in that book that I, resonates so well uh, with the crisis we're going through. He talks about three strands that make up what he calls the cord of Catholicity. There's the word we proclaim, there's the sacrament we celebrate, but then there's the office of unity, the structure of authority, the Petrine principle. And he insists that that's primary. In order to validate the word we proclaim, the sacrament we consume and celebrate, we have to have an office of unity. Mm -hmm. The church is holy, Catholic, and apostolic, but only because she is first one. And we see this with Peter and John rushing to the empty tomb. I mean, who deserves to go in first? John. The one guy who didn't betray Jesus. And what does John do? He defers to Peter because Peter is Pope. Let him go in, make the inspection. That's what validates the whole sacramental order, the office of unity. And isn't it curious that Jesus would himself make orders a sacrament? So without that, we've got nothing. And I'm struck by why, you know, bright boys like Luther and Calvin <laughs> couldn't see it. I mean, for Calvin, nothing finite will ever mediate the infinite. What an impoverishment. I mean, that suggests that even when we pray, we can't make contact with God. We're sort of back in the universe that Aristotle envisioned. When you pray, you're just talking to yourself. Well, you're not talking to yourself in this book. You're talking to us. And I pray that you get uh, the audience uh, you deserve. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, final thoughts. First thought, as an ex-Calvinist, I'll come to the defense of Calvin. <laughs> the finite cannot mediate the infinite yeah. unless the infinite overcomes the limitations yeah. of the finite. Yeah. Apart from Christ's incarnation, we could do nothing yeah. to mediate yeah. Yeah. the Trinity. Yeah. And so, I mean, this gives me that sense of, since we're on a roll with Baltazar titles, love alone is credible. Yeah. But it's not just our love for God, it's God's love for us. We love because he first loved us. He loved us infinitely. We can love him finitely in, in fits and starts. But the, the point that I also wanted to make in this, in this few minutes here um, is what you're doing with Hebrews. I mean, a year ago, you and I were at that conference at Mundelein on Aquinas on Hebrews. And I remember listening to the paper that you gave, and then we had a conversation afterwards. But if there is one book of the New Testament does a most thorough job of opening up the deepness of uh, the depth of the Old Testament, it's Hebrews. And to point to Christ's priesthood, it's the only book in the New Testament that speaks of him as a priest explicitly, but it's the covenant, it's the new covenant, it's the blood, it's the body, it's the Eucharist. And that explains Melchizedek, the first person to be called priest, and what is his sacrifice? Bread and wine, where? Salem, later called Jerusalem, Psalm 76. I mean, like spokes that converge upon the hub of a wheel, the hub is Christ, and all of these Old Testament spokes are sort of unintelligible. But once we recognize the, 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 the content and unity of the scriptures, the old and the new, the living tradition, and then the third criteria is the analogy of faith. If we just put into practice what Vatican II was calling for in the reading of scripture, we would celebrate the Eucharist as the fulfillment of the old, as what is happening in heaven, as it's brought to us on earth. It's the same body that was in the room on Thursday on the cross on Friday, in the tomb on Saturday, but it is the glorified humanity, the divinized humanity that is divinizing us. I mean, that's more than angels can express in gratitude and celebration. So the material in Hebrews, I hope you continue fleshing that out because that is just going to be a feast for many generations. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Father Anthony, final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm happy to have had the chance to, to write this book and certainly hope that it it does something to encourage people above all. Um, I think we're in a moment um, where a lot of people um, see the, 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 the weakness, the sins of the priesthood, and I think it's important to find a way within the church to acknowledge that very honestly um, and not to lose sight of the glory of the priesthood um, and to somehow hold these two together. I think the scriptures give us a way to do that, and I hope the Bible can help us approach the scriptures um, more profitably um, in, in that way. Um, 
uh, uh, John Randolph said when Madison uh, wrote a book um, to, to try to hold off the War of 1812 that I'd have all my enemies write a book. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I mean, obviously, it's, it's only when the Lord can, can touch people's hearts, and uh, I think this is, this is just a gesture, but um, I, I, I hope that the image, uh, above all, I think of St. Peter, um, would just resonate with people um, as the, the Lord's own choice um, of a rock on which to build his church. Um, and the Lord chooses him not in spite of his humanity, but because of his humanity no. and uses that to build a church that, that will not fail. So my, my prayer uh, and hope is just that uh, we all see the priesthood with, uh, with the gratitude uh, that it deserves as, as God's own gift to us. Well, thank you. If you would like to learn more about today's topic, we have a free handout, a brief selection taken from Father's book. The short selection is yours for free by going online to faithandreason.com slash presents or calling the number we'll provide momentarily. Uh, Father, the, the word that you just used is that your hope is that it's an encouragement. And that's absolutely what it was. I, I found myself not exactly sure what I was getting into when, when I sat down and, and was, was profoundly encouraged by it uh, on a couple of levels. One, that we get to be, and we all participate in one way, right? To get to be a part of something that, that the Lord has been doing for literally thousands of years. It didn't start at the Last Supper, right? That's substantially different. So that was very encouraging. But also, you, you handle, I think, sensitively the, the weakness and the brokenness and the sinfulness of the priesthood. You don't shy away from that. Uh, in my mind, sometimes I was thinking that the, the prophets are like the media, right? They're, they're pointing out and that's all they want to yeah. see, but that's the reality is that's only just one part of it. But I must say, as I was reading and just honestly praying a little bit more about it, there was this sense of, of encouragement that, that it's, it's some of the individuals have failed, but the priesthood itself is glorious. Uh, I go back to sitting in your class, Dr. Martin, and I think I know that I've spoken this before, but uh, one of the courses that, that Regis had was uh, he was talking about the church and he was saying that, that she is both holy and she is scandalous. And if we can't reconcile that, we, we will always be in a angst and confusion. And, and that's the same thing with the priesthood. She is both holy and she is scandalous. And you finally said this is that the reality is that's what it is for the church. It's what it is for the priesthood. It's what it is for me. It's what it is for you. It's what it is for you. Uh, is this, this possibility that both are true? And I think you do that beautifully. So if your desire was to encourage, uh, you've done that very well. So thank you very much. How about you close us with a prayer and a blessing? Sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your goodness, the gift of your glory the gift of your holy church. We thank you also for your mercy shown to us uh, through the holy priesthood of your son, Jesus Christ. Pray that you would fill all of our hearts with, with hope and encouragement, uh, trust and confidence uh, that you constantly work in your church for our good and the salvation of all men. We ask you to bless all priests, all those who have the priesthood of the faithful, uh, and to bless all those out there viewing today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com slash presents. You can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu. Or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800-783-6447.